This video is intended for those who do not know what functional programming is, with an assumption. In order to be aware of the fact that you don't know what functional programming is, I suppose you must be familiar with some other programming paradigm, that is, you should be familiar with some language similar to one of these. Great. Now, one thing that you'll have probably realized by now is that, despite having a few things in common, these languages also have lots of differences. I'm not talking about differences in syntax. Syntax doesn't matter. I'm talking about semantics, the meaning and behavior of your programs. Let's take C. You may know that C doesn't have classes or objects, unlike C++, Java and Python. We say that C is an imperative language, since its instructions are shaped like commands, and that it is procedural, since it is based on procedure calls, usually improperly referred to as function calls. I'm sure some of you will disagree about the improperly, but I'm also sure that you all know that procedure means different things in different contexts. Sometimes it's used to denote a piece of code that does not return a value, as opposed to a function, which does. In this video, by procedure, I mean any sequence of instructions, which may well contain a return, while a function, in the functional programming sense, is a much more abstract idea, which we will explore later in the video. Java and its classy friends on the other hand, are called object-oriented languages, but the instructions inside their methods are still commands, so these languages are still based on the same imperative paradigm. One of the things that make functional languages most different from the ones you're probably used to is the fact that the instructions are not commands, but expressions. And a program is not a concatenation of declarations and commands, but a composition of functions. We'll call this property 1. There's also another big difference, the biggest one probably, and I'll introduce it later in the video. When we refer to functions, we mean it in the mathematical sense of maps between sets, such that the output depends solely on the input. A procedure can be a function, for example, this Python procedure is a function that takes an integer and returns an integer. In mathematical notation, we would write this function as f from integers to integers, such that x maps to x squared. This symbol here means maps to, and writing f such that x maps to x squared is equivalent to writing f such that f of x equals x squared. I prefer to use the maps to notation here since it allows for a better transition later in the video. Let's look at another example that should bring us a little bit closer to the functional paradigm. If we wanted to define a Python function that returns the sum of the squares of two numbers, we could either write the following procedure, or if we wanted to separate the operations, write something like this. Now remember what we said about the functional paradigm, property 1. Rather than using a concatenation of declarations and commands, we want to use function composition. So we can rewrite the function like this. This is closer to satisfying the first property. There is still a problem though. That return thing over there is a command. And one command is enough to make this computation a concatenation of commands, thus violating property 1. We can solve this by introducing a second property of functional programming languages, the presence of anonymous functions. An anonymous function is a function without a name. We will represent anonymous functions, at least for now, by means of the maps to notation. Instead of writing our function like this, we will stop using Python for a while and represent our function in a weird mathematical pseudo-language, like this. Notice that we use the same equals symbol that we might have used to assign the value 3 to an integer variable x. This is a hint to the most important property of all. Anonymous functions can be assigned to variables, the very same way that a number can be assigned to a variable. Numbers can be the input and output of functions, so I guess the next obvious step would be using anonymous functions as the input of other functions, like so, and also 
as the result of other functions. In this case, the function foo is a function that returns a function. So this returns the function that multiplies the input by 2. Hence the following computes the value 2 times 5. Should we call this property 3? I guess. This is, I think, the most important property of functional programming languages. This may or may not surprise you, but several languages you may already know, like Python and JavaScript, already have the possibility of writing programs that satisfy these three properties. For example, you can write anonymous functions and pass them to other functions in Python by using this syntax, and in JavaScript by using this other syntax. This is because these languages are multi-paradigm languages. But what about purely functional languages? Python and JavaScript allow us to use functional tools while still having the possibility to concatenate commands. How do you do like iteration without the ability to concatenate commands? In purely functional languages we don't have iteration, but it's not really necessary. Functional languages use recursion as their equivalent of iteration. As you may know, every while loop can be transformed into a tail recursive function by moving the variables you're checking from the god to the base case of the recursive function. If you're familiar with recursion and you're using it already in your paradigm of choice, the transition to any functional language will be quite smooth. Another thing you may be asking yourself is what about conditionals? Well, I'm sure you've used some sort of inline conditional already, or ternary operator, so it's basically the same. And this is already most of what you need to know in order to have a vague idea of what functional programming is like. But you want the good stuff, don't you? The lambda juice to call it the purity, the platonic world of ideas. The Python syntax for anonymous functions contains the word lambda. This is derived from a notation introduced by Alan Turing's scholar friend, Alonzo Church. He wrote the functions I represented with the maps2 with a different notation that features the Greek letter lambda. Actually, this is a bit wrong, since in lambda calculus, which is what we're doing right now, functions have a fixed arity of 1, which means they only have one parameter. Functions with more than one parameter can be simulated by doing something like this. If the previous function was in mathematical notation, a function from the integers times the integers to the integers, which means a function that takes couples of integers as its input and returns a single integer, this new function is from the integers to the set of functions from the integers to the integers. It is quite simple to show that these two functions, called in these two different ways, are in fact equivalent. This property is known as currying. To be even more precise, lambda calculus does not even have an explicit notion of numbers or operations, or booleans, or even recursion. For example, numbers are represented like this, and this thing, called the Y combinator, makes recursion. Luckily for us, we don't need to use the lambda calculus in its original form, just like we don't need to use Turing machines or general recursive functions. In fact, modern functional languages are very rich of features that make them very suitable for some tasks. The functional language I'm most familiar with happens to be OCaml. The most powerful tool in OCaml is one called pattern matching. The simplest way I can describe pattern matching is, it's like a switch, but rather than checking the value of a variable, it checks whether an expression matches a pattern. This, used together with algebraic data types, makes writing interpreters in OCaml almost trivial. A lot of verification tools and proof assistants are based on functional programming, and some of them are written in OCaml. Apparently, there is also at least one company that uses OCaml for their services. But why am I saying all this? Why do I have to point out that there actually are 
areas in which functional programming is much more suitable than other paradigms. Well, because you may have heard some people claim that huh, functional programming is useless, I mean, computation without state is sure elegant, but no collateral effects? How can a programming language be useful if it can't even print a screen? So apparently there is one thing I forgot to mention – collateral effects. If you cannot concatenate commands, you cannot do something like this. Printing, raising exceptions and other things like these cannot be done in a standard way. There are several ways to have collateral effects in a purely functional language. One of which is monads. Other languages like OCaml simply include the possibility to have collateral effects by breaking the first property and allowing the user to concatenate a function of return type unit, which is basically a call to a void function, to your expression. So basically, no, you do have ways to print in function languages, even in pure ones. In general, I think it's a good thing that basically all modern languages have functional features. Apart from Java, introducing lambdas in Java was a bit of a mistake, but Java as a whole was a bit of a mistake, so that's another story. The more paradigms a language can support, the more we can adapt it to our needs and use the most appropriate paradigm each time. I hope I gave you a decent overview of the main characteristics of functional languages. Let me know what you think in the comments. See you next time.